Happy Monday, friends. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm gonna dive right into our scripture. Tonight is Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the great things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So what I love about the scripture, there's so much going on here. Let me just set the scene really quickly. Remember, um, we've talked earlier about Paul being imprisoned when he writes a lot of his letters, his epistles. And of course, this is true for this letter to the church at Philippi. So while he is in, um, imprisoned in, in Rome, and again, he's on that house arrest type prison, still prison nonetheless. And while he's waiting, actually he's waiting for his trial. And he knows that when he goes before Caesar and when he has this trial, there's a really good chance that he is going to be crucified. He's going to be martyred. So it's in that state of uncertainty and with his freedoms being taken away from him already um, that he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. And what does he start off with? Rejoice. And it's as if he can hear us say, uh, Paul, do you, do you not see where you are? Do, do you not understand that you don't have a lot of your freedoms? And in fact, you may never have them again because as soon as your trial comes up, there's a real good chance that you're going to die. And it's as if he knows that the church is, is going to be asking that question. So then I love how he says, and let me say it again, rejoice in the Lord. So here's this man in the deepest, darkest time, what we often call the dark night of the soul. And he's rejoicing. Um, just truly amazing. And, and yet, you know, we think about this time that he wrote this probably between 60 and 62 AD. And while he was a contemporary of the 12 disciples, of course, he came on the scene later after his conversion on the road to Damascus. Um, but he had been with people who had seen the risen Christ. And I guess you could say in a way, his own conversion experience of speaking with God on that road to Damascus. And, and I suppose that there's something about literally, tangibly uh, having that experience and speaking with those who have seen the risen Christ, that death just doesn't quite have the same sting, quite frankly. Um, it, you know, he, he knows that there's something beyond it. He knows that he knows that he knows that there's something beyond it. He doesn't wish for his death. He's not trying to expedite it by any stretch of the imagination. But I suppose we can grant Paul that. But brothers and sisters, we have that same knowledge. Maybe we haven't talked to someone, obviously, who has seen the risen Christ in the way that Paul was able to, but we have the same spirit within us. I remember how we talked a few weeks ago about that spirit um, can give us the same mind of Christ. And he mentions it here. Did you hear it again in Philippians? He mentions it here when he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He knows that these two are connected. We need to have the heart guarded against um, being closed off because of prior wounds and hurts. And he knows the mind needs to be guarded so that it is in Christ Jesus. So I, there's just, this is just so rich and full of so many things. Um, a translation for the phrase, do not worry uh, about anything. One of the Hebrews translations that I was reading also uh, says that this is translated as take no thought for tomorrow. Have you ever noticed that we can be so preoccupied about what may or may not happen tomorrow? Uh, and that's why he's saying, take no thought for tomorrow. Like, don't be anxious about any of that. Um, my sister and I were talking recently uh, about, you know, so, some situations in life. 
and that could cause worry, right? That would be justified to kind of go forward in the future and have some stress or anxiety. And as we were talking about it, I was sharing with her with the situation with Knox last fall when I was with you guys during that intense period of time, clearly there was a lot of uncertainty in the future. And there is for all of us, but certainly when you're in a medical crisis. And I was so grateful that the Holy Spirit really impressed upon me that that was an option that I had and it was understandable. I could certainly go to tomorrow and I could really worry about the what ifs. But he impressed upon me, if I do that, if I choose to do that, I not only lose the joy of tomorrow because that day that I'm worried about may never come, I'm also losing the joy of the present moment and of today. And that really spoke volumes to me. No, today is a good day. Today I woke up. Today my son woke up. I'm not gonna worry about tomorrow. God's got tomorrow. Let me focus on today and being in the present moment. So I hope that that speaks to you. And it doesn't have to be something grand or big like a medical crisis. You know, I think sometimes we berate ourselves when our worries are about, quote, you know, trivial things. It's, that's, don't go there because if they're worrying you, they're important to you and they're important to God. Um, what's beautiful though is that the scripture speaks to all of it. It speaks about the smallest thing and it speaks about the biggest thing. And it's just saying, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, give it all to God. And I love that part about with thanksgiving. We've talked about this before too in the past couple of weeks. I don't know about you, but I prefer to thank people and thank God after the uh, thing that I was requesting has taken place, right? So with God, it would obviously be a prayer request. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you, you got it backwards. When you're asking God, you go ahead and thank him. Because guess what? God is God. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And remember, we're not going to praise him for what he can do for us. We're not going to manipulate him. That kind of God is not worth worshiping. It's not the kind of God we have. Our God is worth worshiping just because he is the great I am. Just because he loves us, he cares for us, he knows the number of hairs on our heads, and he is who he is. So that in and of itself is worthy of praise. So I just love how Paul kind of reminds us of that. You know, you don't wait for your Thanksgiving later. Go ahead and give it to him now. And then to close us out in Philippians, how he lists all of these incredible things to keep our mind on. You know, guys, we're in control of what we bring in uh, to a certain extent. You know, bus drives by and it has an ad on it, or we're driving and we see a billboard. Um, true, those things we may not have an opportunity to filter out. But as far as um, social media, as far as news, local and national, all of that kind of stuff, we have the opportunity to filter that out. Now, no one's asking us to bury our heads in the sand and pretend that things aren't going on, that they aren't. That's not what we're talking about. But just knowing the level that it affects you and being able to make sure that you are balancing out any true yet negative stuff that's coming in with true yet positive stuff. Sometimes we can get so focused, you know, on all that's happening that's negative, and there's a lot of it, that we forget to just be blessed by the moment and concentrate on all the good things that are going on. So think about that, and as Paul closes us out in Philippians about, you know, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is commendable, whatever is honest, whatever has excellence, think about those things during your day too and you'll have a little bit more balanced thought process. Let's move into our time of meditation because another translation of that um, in verse eight, where he talks about um, to think about whatever is true and pleasing, another translation is to meditate. So that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna meditate on these things. So come to your comfortable seated position, either at the edge of your chair or your sofa, maybe you're on the floor, maybe you're on the edge of a table or an ottoman, Wherever you are, that's where you want to be, and you want to come to the edge of it. If you're on the floor a little bit different, you're just going to make sure that your sits bones are touching the floor. And wherever we are, if we're on um, a piece of furniture, we're going to make sure that we also have our sits bones grounded. So take a moment. I'm going to do the same and make sure that my sits bones, I can really feel sinking into the cushion of my chair right now. I can lean forward. I can lean back. I can lean to side to side and I feel those sits bones grounding me. Now remember the reason we want to ground those sits bones is we want to use them as leverage. We push them into the earth 
At the same time, we visualize the crown of the head moving upward toward heaven. And in so doing, we have elongated the spine between the two. So take a moment and do that. Bear the sits bones down, elongate the crown of the head up, and create the space in between. Ah, you'll notice too that the sternum, the bony part of our breastplate, that sternum is gonna want to move forward and slightly up. And as it does, the shoulders just relax down kind of into the hip pockets. If we were wearing jeans, just kind of imagine those shoulders just sliding all the way down. So really allowing space in between the earlobe and the top of the deltoid. And now, as you are comfortable, I'm gonna ask you to place one hand in the center of the chest, one hand on your lower abdomen, and to close your eyes. And as we close our eyes, we draw a long, fluid, deep breath in. And as we exhale, we slowly release as mindfully as we brought it in. As we inhale, you're drawing the breath in through your nose first. You're taking it into the lungs and you notice they rise and press against the palm of the hand that is there, but we won't stop there. We'll continue to inhale through the gateway of the diaphragm, allowing the warmth of the air to enter into the belly and we'll feel it also rise and press against the palm of the hand there. There's a slight pause. And then as we begin to exhale, we'll visualize that belly button of ours pulling itself back toward the spine. And in so doing, the breath is gonna be released up and out of the belly, up and out of the gateway of the diaphragm, and up and out of the lungs and the nose from which it came. Now you, on your own pacing, or with your own pacing, draw your own long, fluid, deep breath in. Slight pause and then begin to exhale. And as you're breathing, just notice how your mind is starting to make that transition from what I'm sure was a busy, hopefully in a really wonderful way, day, to now closing the eyes as you are comfortable and just focusing on all that's happening internally, not the least of which is this breath inside of you. This breath that God tells us is actually the avenue through which he chooses to give us life. He formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils, it said. Such an intimate God. Breathe into our nostrils the breath of life. So this breath is his. So as you breathe in the breath, breathe in the breath giver. So inhale, God, we bring in your goodness and we bring in your glory. And we thank you for the grace that you give us each and every day. And Father, as we exhale, may we release our doubts. May we release our fears. And may we release our worries. Draw him in long, fluid, deep breath. As the mind starts to wander, don't let that frustrate you or take you off course. Come back to your breath. That's why the hands are there. Tangibly feel that breath, kinesthetic awareness. And as you draw that next breath in, let the mind go right there with it and the two will unite. Ah, so in this state of relaxation, and you've now lowered your blood pressure, Amazingly, you've also lowered your resting heart rate and at the same time, you have increased the amount of oxygen uptake or the amount of oxygen circulating throughout your bloodstream. Truly a gift from the Most High God that when we tap into our breath, we tap into Him and the body can't help but respond in the most beautiful, relaxing ways. So breathe him in again. And then slowly breathe you out. With your eyes still closed, I want you to visualize your mind, your actual brain. Visualize that gray matter, with all the deep crevices and wrinkles. And I want you to think about your thoughts. 
maybe scanning in, in this time instead of a specific time frame of thoughts. I want you to think about patterns of thought, narratives, if you will. These patterns of thought or narratives can be about yourself. They can be about others in your life. They might be about your work life, maybe about your social life, maybe about something going on in our state or our nation. And I want you to think about that, hold it right there after you've kind of named it, and kind of ask yourself these questions that Paul reflects back to us. As you're thinking and holding that subject, whatever it is, that theme, if you will, ask yourself this, is it true? Is it honorable? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it pleasing? Is it commendable? If there is any excellence in it, is it worthy of praise? Hmm. Now take that same subject, that same theme. Again, it could be about you, it could be about someone else, it could, could be about a situation. And now think, okay, I can't ignore this thing, this theme. How could I choose to view it now in light of that? So now, keep that same subject, that same theme, hold that in your thought, in your mind, and say, how can I bring truth to this subject? How can I bring honor to it? How can I bring justice to this situation? How can I bring purity into this thought? How can I make it pleasing and commendable? How can I make it an excellent theme or subject to be meditating or thinking a lot about? And finally, how can I make it worthy of praise? Mm. With your hands still on your heart and in your, on your belly, think now in your mind's eye to your heart. And think about a prayer request that you have of God. Think about a need. And let's visit earlier in our verse. Verse 6. So visualize what that is, what that need is, what that prayer request is. Hold it in your mind's eye, even though it's in your heart where you're holding it. And think about these words from Paul. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I've heard it put this way, with your eyes still closed as long as you're comfortable. I've heard this scripture, Philippians 4, 4 through 9, summed up as the acrostic calm, C-A-L-M. The C is for celebrate. After all, Paul starts off, rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. So just start off just celebrating God for who and what he is. The A is asking God for help. That's what we just looked at in verse 6. The L is for leaving your concerns with him, that last part of verse 6, by prayer and thanksgiving. You're going to just give it to him, let your request be made known to him, and, and you're going to leave it with him. And that requires trust. And the last one is M, meditate on these good things. So we went through an exercise today, not only in looking at objectively our thoughts and asking if they were even worthy of being held in our mind. And then secondly, we turned it around and said, okay, this is a thought that I need to be aware of. How can I meditate on it and turn it into those things that are edifying me? So calm, C-A-L-M, celebrate, ask, Leave your concerns with God and M for meditate. Father, I lift up this group. They mean so much to me. I thank you for bringing them into my life. 
I thank you, Father, for your words. That some 2,000 years after they were written, at least these letters from Paul, we can gain such incredible insights. Thank you for your truth, Father, and for its preservation that we get to be beneficiaries of it. May we never take that for granted. Father, as we enter into this week, be with us. Remind us to celebrate you, to ask you for help in places that we need it in all of our lives. There are places. And then remind us once we ask it to leave it with you and to trust you, grow our trust in you, Father. And then help us to meditate on things that are really worth meditating upon. We ask all these things in the holy and the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the redeemer of the human race, whose very name means God saves. Amen and amen. Good night, everybody. Until we see you next week, have a good one. Bye.